uh, coming into this message, I'm always thinking, hey, in what ways can you tell the Easter story in a way that they're like, I've never heard that passage uh, talked about on Easter. And hopefully uh, this will come with some fresh insight to make Easter and what took place in the resurrection uh, more alive and fresh and um, something of substance in your life. But it does have me thinking about all the strange things we say. You ever found that to be the case? We just say strange things. A lot of times we repeat things that we've heard other people say, but we don't know where it comes from and we don't even actually know what it means. What I mean by that is how many of you have ever heard the statement, bite the bullet? Wave at me if you've ever heard the statement, bite the bullet. Yeah, that's an interesting statement. Where does that come from? Well, come to find out there was a physician who was doing surgery who had a patient in pain. And he decided, hey, we have to do something to help this patient manage their pain. Quick, give them a bullet to chew on. And that's how it began. Someone in the doctor's office chewing on a firearm. And now we say to each other, hey, just bite the bullet. That's a random thing to say. It's strange when you know where it came from. Or how many of you have ever heard the statement, the cat got your tongue? You ever heard that? You said it to your kids. Someone gets lippy and you say, excuse me. And then they, they start to pause. And you're like, yeah, cat got your tongue. Well, the original uh, origin of that story is there was a monarch who took confidentiality too seriously. And he had a rule with his leaders that if you ever leaked any confidential information, they would cut out your tongue and feed it to the cats. Yeah, that's not what you mean when you say it to your kid, but that's what it originally meant. Or like this week coming into Easter, I had a handful of people say, hey, pastor, we're praying for you. Don't break a leg. Ever heard that one? Don't break a leg. And I think there's a lot of superstition and the idea behind that is, hey, don't get hurt before you have to stand in front of people and speak. But the original statement is not don't break a leg. What's the original statement? Break a leg. Yeah. And what does that mean? The original idea was do so well in your performance that at the end you have to break a leg, that you have to bend the knee to give a bow. And I love that. And in some way, I hope that at the end of today's service, we all feel the impulse to break a leg, to bend a knee, because scripture says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And all God's people said, amen, yeah. And it's a wonderful thing that we get to celebrate, but there are things that we even say as Christians that are strange. A lot of times people repeat things that they don't even know what they're saying. Have you ever found that we say some strange things in the church? Now, if you can't admit that, uh, and if we ever lose awareness of our uniqueness, I think we would miss the mark. There are some strange things that we say and we adhere to. You ever been weirded out in church? Like, chances are you're new to Northview and we've already weirded you out. I mean, you're sitting here and you're thinking, wow, there's a lot going on. The music, lights got my attention. I mean, the person in my room, uh, my row is very enthusiastic in their worship. Anyone sitting next to an enthusiastic worshiper? Like they not only raise their hands, but they got some like hip hop moves a part of their routine and they need space. And you're thinking to yourself, what did I get myself into today? And then you hear the last two songs we sing. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. And what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. And when I first showed up to the church, I found myself like, all right, the people are great. I, I, I'm in but their obsession with blood is flat out weird. <laughs> Anyone else, you're like, I, I don't know if I understand all this. And it's actually a beautiful story and there's a lot of substance to it. See, what you find, and if you're new to the Bible, the Bible is a library of 66 books, of which the first book is what? Genesis, yeah. And in Genesis, God creates the heavens and the earth. Chapter one gives us the creation account. It is wonderful, it's beautiful, it's mesmerizing. And he sets the stage and then he brings his masterpiece into play. And what was the masterpiece of his creation? Humanity. And he puts humanity in the garden. Creation begins with a wedding in which he unites man and woman. It's beautiful. And then these two mess it up. 
Eve falls to temptation. Adam advocates his leadership. He then falls to temptation and they crack the door and sin and shame enter the world. I mean, God's like a couple weeks into this thing and it's like, you've already messed up my creation. Now, let's pretend that you're God, as if you've never pretended that. And let's just say you created all this and then the first two humans on the planet ruin it. What would you do? How would you respond? Most of us would wanna take them out back and give them a whooping. Like you just ruined my creation, but the good news is, God's better than you and he's better than me. And he doesn't show up malicious and he doesn't show up uh, mean. He shows up with grace. He shows up with patience and he shows up with redemption in his heart. And he makes a declaration day one after the fall. And he makes it an earshot of the serpent. And he said, there will come one from this woman who will stomp on your head. So hard, he's going to bruise his heel. Now, anyone appreciate some good old Bible trash talk? My son is gonna stomp on your head. And eventually that's what happens. Jesus shows up, he goes to the cross, he defeats death, hell, and the grave, and he stomps on Satan's head. This is why snakes don't have arms and feet. Because of the cross, the serpent has been disarmed and defeated. Oh, come on, church. You gotta work with me. I nailed that one. Nothing but net, right? And it's amazing because God has redemption in his heart, but how does he do it? How are you gonna redeem the world? And what is amazing is he's meticulous. He doesn't cut corners. He is creative and brilliant and he's sovereign and he's diligent and he is committed to the process and he does it gradually over time with precision and perfection. How does he do it? He first raises up a man by the name of Abraham who raises up a family, who raises up a tribe, who raises up a nation, who becomes the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. These are initially the people and the chosen people of God. It's wonderful. Now, what you're gonna find in the Bible, and you owe it to yourself to, to read it and to take it all in, is in God's redemptive plan, he establishes four things. One, the lineage. A son will come of this woman. A descendant will come of this woman. There's the lineage. There is the law. There is the land, right? So there's all these. And then lastly, there is the Lord. Lineage, land, law, Lord. Does that make sense? And so you see this play out in the Old Testament. And what is amazing is, again, when you open up the pages, you go Genesis, second book, Exodus, third book, Leviticus. And have you ever read something in the Bible that was just weird? Now, if you can't acknowledge that, you're like, I've never read anything in the Bible that's weird. You've never read the Bible. <laughs> the Bible is full of things that will have you scratching your head thinking, wow, that's different. For example, there are a ton of animal sacrifices in the Bible. And if that makes you uncomfortable, you're reading it correctly. Because what you find in the Bible is there was always sacrifices made for the sins of the nation. So where there is a sacrifice and death, there is sin. And, and really the reminder throughout the Old Testament is where there is sin, there is death. Where there is sin, there is death. Romans would say it this way, uh, for the wages of sin is death, yeah. And where does this all begin? The book of Leviticus. You know, so Abraham you know, builds his family, the nation's up and going. A guy by the name of Moses takes lead. He's the lawgiver who comes down with the, the 10 commandments. He has a brother by the name of Aaron who takes the role as priest. And I know this is a lot of information, but again, my job is not to build a crowd, it's to build Christians. This will serve you well. And what you discover is in Leviticus chapter 16, they establish in the temple what is known as the day of atonement. Someone say atonement. Now, this is a pretty simple, basic word that you can grab a hold of pretty quickly. Essentially, it means the cancellation of a debt. The, the cancellation or the debt paid in full. So when Jesus is on the cross and he says, it is finished, that's a clerical term, debt paid in full, atonement. Well, in the day of atonement, 
In Leviticus chapter 16, Moses tells his brother Aaron, God says you need to get two goats, which is exactly what you showed up to church to hear about, two goats. And the first goat needs to be sacrificed for the sins of the nation. And the second goat, the one that gets overlooked, what they would do is the priest would lay his hands on the second goat and he would confess all the sins of the nation. And then what they would do is they would have one individual take the goat out into the wilderness where no one knows where the person's going and to release the goat to where nobody could find it. And why do this? You see, when God shows up to have a conversation with Adam and Eve in the garden after you know, they had fallen to temptation, it's very clear, okay, I have to do something about sin and I have to do something about sin's ugly twin, shame. And that's what you see immediately in the garden. They are covered in shame and they're hiding from God. And he says, okay, when I begin to make things right, we have to deal with sin and we have to deal with shame. The, the painful experience, the nagging awareness that you're broken, imperfect, unworthy, and undeserving of unconditional love and union with your heavenly father. That's shame. That's a painful experience that people uh, live with. And what is interesting to me is from here on out, you see all these sacrifices. And what you have to do when you're reading the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, so the Bible breaks into two, Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, you have to always be reading with the question in mind, how does this help me understand Jesus better? How does this point to Jesus? In what way is this a foreshadow or a foretelling or an image of Christ? Does that make sense? And as you get into the pages of scripture, I mean, there's a lot of sacrifices. And for the young people in the room, maybe you'll understand it this way. If you've ever been shopping and your parents just gave you their credit card to go shopping, come on, Hamilton County kids, wave at me. <laughs> If your parents ever gave you their credit card, yeah, that's a sweet gig, snooty booties, right? <laughs> and here's how that works. You go to the cash register and you pay, but what are you assuming? When the bill shows up, mom and dad are gonna pick up the tab, right? Well, yeah, that's how sacrifices worked in the Old Testament. Essentially, they were buying grace on credit. Essentially, what would happen is they'd, sacrifice birds, lambs, goats, cows, and one might get you a week, a month, a year, but essentially they are buying grace on credit, assuming at some point someone's gonna show up and pick up the tab. And anyone thankful that someone showed up and picked up the tab and paid the thing in full? His name is Jesus Christ. He's going to pick up the tab, and, and I just think that is remarkable that he does so. And Jesus is the fulfillment of all that. In fact, what you find in addition to the sacrifices is a ton of prophecies. So as this hope is building in the people of God, someone's gonna pick up the tab, someone's gonna pick up the tab. Well, that is being informed by all these prophets that God is raising up. Individuals who would predict, uh, predict and foretell of the coming Messiah, the chosen one, the savior of the world, the one who's gonna redeem all things. And what begins to happen is centuries begin to stack up. Prophets who never met each other, never got to have conversations, never got to look at the, the grand plan and say, hey, how does my story fit with your story? No, they all just communicated what God put on their heart. You get down the road and there's hundreds of prophecies that this one Jesus has to show up and fulfill. You would look at the list and think, well, that's impossible. In fact, I would encourage every single one of you, please do not take my word for it. Go home, open up Google, and just search in the Google tab, what are the chances that Jesus Christ could fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies? And you're going to be blown away. You're gonna find more confidence to stand on when it comes to your faith. They say that if Christ just fulfilled maybe 40 or 50, which he fulfilled hundreds, but let's just say he fulfilled 40 or 50. They said the odds of that happening, you would have a better chance of winning the lottery in multiple states on the same day than Christ fulfilling all those prophecies. Again, don't take my word for it. I don't need to prop up God's word. What he did is pretty impressive. 
And Jesus eventually shows up and he's nothing like people expected. He doesn't show up braggadocious. He doesn't show up demanding attention. He shows up meek. He shows up humble. He's full of grace. He's loving. And he is patient with broken people everywhere he goes. It's wonderful. He begins to usher in the kingdom of God. He begins to teach of his ethic of love. And he begins to march towards the cross. And what is amazing to me about the gospels is you find Jesus saying the same thing over and over and over again. Hey guys, I'm going to die and then I'm gonna come back to life. Mom, I'm going to die and then I'm gonna come back to life. Peter, James, and John, I'm going to die and then I'm gonna come back to life. Mary Magdalene, do you have it? James, Thomas, do you have it? I'm going to die and then I'm gonna come back to life. And then he dies and he comes back to life and no one sees it coming. It's like, this is all he's been talking about. It's been the same thing. How didn't anyone see it coming? Well, it's pretty easy. No one had ever seen anything like it. Even when you're told to look for it, you can't imagine it. And most of you, if you're not a Christian, you're skeptical and you think, well, that's just impossible. Uh, People don't come back to life. I've never seen someone come back to life. Well, that's a fair criticism. The problem is you've only been staring at people, not at God. And I'm glad my God can do some things I can't. And I'm glad God can do some things you can't. He's God and he defeated death, hell, and the grave. And you can go nuts on scripture and you can just talk about all the different accounts. But if you have your Bibles, go to John chapter 20. Now, if you're new to Northview, I love to have people repeat words. One, I think a conversation is better than a lecture. Two, you repeating it helps me remember my outline. So stay with me. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, someone say dark. You know, thankful for a God who shows up in the dark, a God who's not afraid or intimidated of the dark, a God who invades darkness with light. In fact, again, you go back to the book of Genesis and it says darkness covered the deep and that it, the, the world was formless and void. And God said, let there be light. Our first introduction to God is bringing light into dark spaces. Now, here would be a fun study for you to look at. We don't have time to put it on the screen today, but if you go to Genesis chapter one, at the end of every single day, there's this summarizing statement, which a good handle for you to pay attention to is anytime the Bible gets repetitive, God is making a point. So in the very first chapter of the Bible, it says the same statement at the end of every single day. So God creates something and it says, and there was evening and there was morning day one. And then there was evening and then there was morning day two. And then there was evening and then there was morning day three. Is it getting redundant? It makes the statement every single day of the week. There was evening and there was morning. Let me ask you this way. What comes first in your day, morning or evening? Morning, yeah, because you and I live with a paradigm way of thinking that we are moving from light to dark. But God says from the very beginning, this is a movement that moves from darkness to light. There was evening and then there was morning. From day one, this movement goes from darkness to light. And maybe, just maybe, you should switch the way you view life. And rather than viewing it from going from light to darkness, Maybe you can begin living from darkness to light. It says, while it was still morning, it was still dark. And Mary Magdalene, oh, what a hero. What an iconic individual in scripture. She is a significant player and an individual who was part of the inner circle. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw, someone say saw. She saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Okay, so we're gonna come back to those two words. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Now, what book am I reading? John. Who wrote the book of John? John. Who is the disciple Jesus loved? John. This is like a humble brag, right? The one who Jesus loved, right? So watch this. And she comes to them and says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, 
But the other disciple outran Peter. Anyone got some petty friends in their life? Some competitive friends in their life, right? The other one outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked. So Mary saw, John looked. She bent over, he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb which is great because John was the fastest, Peter was the bravest, which is why we need friends. We balance each other out. And I think in those two, you kind of find a representation of a lot of people in their spiritual journey. Some of you, you're quick to get here, but slow to engage. Others of you, you're slow to get here, but once you're here, you're quick to engage. Some of you are Peter, some of you are John. And Peter gets there and it says he goes straight into the tomb. And verse six, he... Saw, there it is again, the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, watch this shift. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and believed. At first, he only looked. Now, why would I draw your attention to that word? I know it's a lot, but here's the point. The original language that the Bible was written in, where the word saw is, is where you and I get our English word theory, okay? So when it says they saw, a better way for you and I to understand it is they theorized, that they stepped into the tomb and they started developing a theory. They stepped into the tomb and they started thinking critically, which is really important because some of you, you're getting bumped off by petty criticism about your faith and you would be encouraged to know that the first three witnesses of the resurrection were critical thinkers. These weren't people who were gullible and just operating in blind faith. No, they stepped in and they began developing theories. And one thing you are gonna hear is people say, well, this is just a big scam. You're gullible, and all of you Christians, billions of you throughout the ages, have been duped and scammed, and you all were tricked. And I love that conversation. I'm always thinking to myself, well, yeah, let's go with that. So for a second, let's all agree it's a scam. How does this work? How did they pull off the greatest hoax in human history? Let's say it's me and two of you, and we're gonna figure this out. So first, we're gonna have to find a time in the middle of the night. We're gonna have to go when it's dark and somehow we're gonna have to figure out a way to distract the guards. Also, they don't hear or see us pushing a boulder out of the way, right? And then we need to buy enough time so they don't see us running out the tomb with the body. Now, if you and I were to be able to pull that off and we distract the guards and we get the tomb out of the way and we get inside the tomb, what are we gonna find? Jesus's body. And how would it look? It would have been wrapped up like a mummy. Now, one thing you and I are not gonna do, especially if I'm leading the group, I am a germaphobe and I have sensory issues. Sticky things on my fingers stresses me out. Anyone else wave at me if that stresses you out? Yeah, I'm not touching that. So none of us would come into the tomb and think, all right, we're pressed on time. We gotta hurry up and get out before the guards see us. But first, let's unwrap the body. None of us would do that, why? Because we know what happened to his body. We know that he was whipped with a cat of nine tails. We know that he was stabbed in the side with a spear. We know that he had a crown of thorns thrusted upon his head. This body was tore up and it was fresh. Body still bleeding, wounds still oozing. And there's no way we would walk into the tomb and not take advantage of all the dry dressing around this body and instead unwrap the entire body and say, hey, I'll grab the legs, you grab the arms, and we will carry this bloody, slimy body out together. It wouldn't happen. There's so many things in the resurrection story that stick out like this where it's like that just... That's not how you dupe humanity if you're trying to pull off a hoax. When Peter, John, and Mary look into the tomb, they're thinking to themselves, they're theorizing, wait a second, who would steal the body and take off all the linens? And who would go to such great lengths to make sure that the burial cloth was right where his head was at and all those things? It just doesn't make a ton of sense. 
And what you begin to discover as you lean into this is this carries uh, much greater weight and is so much more solid than most people think. I am convinced the resurrection is historical fact. And I am convinced if you were to uh, put forth the academic stamina and energy in terms of researching it for yourself, you would discover you have a much stronger leg to stand on when it comes to your faith. And I love it because there's, there's so many things going on. And what does Mary say when she comes to the entrance? It says, Mary seen that the, the stone had been rolled away from the entrance of the tomb. It's a great way of thinking about it. When you think of the, the opening in a tomb, do you think of it as an exit or an entrance? Mary's seen it as an entrance. It's the right way of seeing it. The, the, the stone was not rolled away so Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so they could get in. It's a beautiful invitation. It's an invitation to every single one of us to acknowledge the emptiness of the tomb means I can have fullness in this life. He came promising abundant life and here's the invitation to step into it. It's not so he can step out, my goodness. It is so you and I can step into the new life, the new life found in only Christ. It's an entrance. And so Mary stays put, Peter, John, they go back. And if you watch how it picks up in chapter 20, Mary stays in the garden by the tomb and verse 11 says, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus, which I think is great. I tend to take pranks too far. Anyone else? It's like, oh, you crossed the line. And I think Jesus is towing the line. If I'm him, I'm coming out like I'm here, right? And he's over there pretending to be the gardener, just having fun with the moment. He has a much better personality than people realize. And Jesus said to her, Mary, which every person's favorite word is their name. And there's certain people in their life who say it in a way that it registers immediately. The way mom says your name, dad says your name, your siblings say your name. And Jesus turns to her and he says, Mary. And that's all he says. And she knows immediately it's Christ. And she cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. What things? I am ascending to the Father. Now, again, I believe this is the greatest moment in human history. And I think it comes with the greatest epiphany ever. You ever had an epiphany? where there was some opinion or belief that you held for some time, and then you have a moment that illuminates your mind and you think to yourself, whoa, I had no idea. I will never look at this the same again. It's an aha moment. And who, I would say, I think cartoonists understand this best. Because if you are watching a cartoon or reading the comments and somebody has a good idea, what pops up next to their head? a light bulb, right? There's something in us intuitively that just understands that the right idea is a bright idea. And it's amazing because the cartoonist of heaven is orchestrating the greatest epiphany ever, which is there's life beyond the grave. There's life beyond the grave. Like death is not a, a prison, it's a passage. And while she is having the greatest epiphany ever, the cartoonist of heaven is like, I need to put a light in the play. And because God is awesome, he has the very sun at his disposal. And so while she's having the epiphany, here comes the sun. It's wild. And the question is, is why Mary? 
Why does Mary get to be the one person out of billions of followers of Christ throughout history that gets to be the one person to experience Christ resurrected first? It's a significant thing. Now, for me and my belief system, I uh, don't believe in chance, I don't believe in coincidence, and I do not believe in luck. I believe that God has a plan and all things work out accordingly, and I think it was Mary because it was supposed to be Mary. I don't think this is by chance. One historian said it this way. He said, Mary is the apostle to the apostles. Wild statement. She was the first person to carry the message, he is risen. I mean, that is such a privilege. And the question that resounds with that is, well, who was she? Mary was in the inner circle. Mary had a front row seat to some of the greatest moments. She was at the cross and she was at the resurrection. And it gets a little confusing because there's actually six women at the, uh, at the crucifixion and four of them had the name Mary. And so it's a lot going on. One of them was Jesus' brother. It's a whole deal. And Mary Magdalene, well, her story's unique. Mary Magdalene had a riddled past. I wonder how many of you have had a rough past. When we first meet Mary Magdalene, the Bible tells us she suffers from seven demons. Now you can speculate, and we're not gonna do that today. I would just guess that the demons she struggled with are very similar to the demons people struggle with today. And nobody could help her. She'd exhausted every option, and then she comes to Jesus, which happens every single week in our church. People have exhausted every single option trying to find identity and purpose and wholeness and peace and restoration in their life, and then they come to Jesus and they realize, oh, I should have just came to him first. Mary comes to Jesus. Jesus sets her free. She joins the inner circle. And it is this Mary who had a known past, this Mary who was possessed by seven demons that gets to be the carrier of the message, he is risen. And the beautiful thing about that is because it's Mary, that means it could have been any of us. If God can entrust this message to someone like her, he can entrust this message to someone like you. What God is saying in allowing Mary to be the first person is here is a woman with a riddled past who has no rights in the culture of the day. Could not testify as an eyewitness, had no credibility in the law system of the day. Someone with a bad past and no rights. And essentially God is making the statement, yeah, but it doesn't matter. There's nothing any one of you can do that could ever mess this up. It's solid and it's completed. And this is the finished work of Christ. What is amazing to me is while you read it, you can't help but pick up on the echoes of Leviticus chapter 16. So think about the moment. Good Friday represents atonement, right? Sin's covered. But what about the second goat? Remember, there was two. It all points to Jesus. The first one covered sin. The second one carried shame. And this is what is beautiful. Mary shows up and she's like, I don't know where they put him. I can't find it. Where did you take him? <laughs> Which would have been similar questions to the people with the second goat. Hey, where did you take that goat? Jesus dies and he goes missing for a moment. And what you discover in this moment is a lot of people don't have an accurate reading of the crucifixion. So when people refer to Golgotha's hill and the three crosses, they often refer to the two thieves on the cross. Ever heard this? The one mocked him, the other put faith in him. There's two thieves on the cross. Where that's inaccurate, and I don't think you need to overthink this, but there weren't two thieves on the cross that day. There were actually three thieves on the cross that day. And the biggest thief was center stage on the middle cross. And unbeknown to everybody, he is robbing humanity of their shame and they don't even see it. It's the greatest heist in human history. Anyone like a good heist movie? Oh, I'm a sucker for a good heist movie. I like Oceans 11, 12, 13. Even if they make Oceans 79, I'm gonna stay committed. I'm a sucker for the format. And the best heist movies, are when the person who's robbing the casino walks out the front door with a duffel bag and no one thinks to themselves, wait a second, 
there goes our money. And what is great is on the cross, Jesus covers our sin. Goat number one. (laughs) And then an individual takes him down and they carry him out. And no one even thinks, wait a second. There goes our shame. He's robbing us of our shame. It's, it's beautiful. And what Mary doesn't realize is here this woman who is known for a pretty rough past, a woman who is known for having seven demons, will forever be known throughout centuries as the first person to experience the resurrected Christ. <laughs> it's amazing. Jesus is saying, yeah, this is what I do in people's lives. I take people who were demon possessed and I turn them into heroes. That's how far I separate you from your shame. And so for some of you, yeah, you've got a riddled past, but you've got an even greater God. And so you should stop holding on to your past because it won't let your future live. And a lot of times we are holding on to shame assuming God's holding out on his grace. God's not holding out on his grace. In fact, if you are in Christ, you have been saved, set free, redeemed, made new. And so if you're still holding on to shame, you've got superficial shame in your hands. You might as well let it go. In Christ, your sin has been covered and your shame has been carried. And Mary is standing there having the greatest epiphany ever, being robbed of her shame. The sun is rising and what is her message to the disciples? He's ascending to the Father. So while the sun is rising, S-U-N, the sun is rising, S-O-N. And the artistry of heaven is on display in which Jesus Christ was rising and Jesus Christ has risen and he is seated high and lifted up on the throne of God in full control, standing triumphant and victorious over the wickedness and the evil and the sin of our world. It's amazing. Jesus dies a vicious death so we can live a victorious life. The emptiness of the tomb means we can have fullness in this life. Jesus takes on your death, oh, so we could take on his life. It's outstanding. The greatest heist in human history, the greatest epiphany in human history. And I'm telling you, the resurrection is a game changer. And I pray you find yourself rising up in faith, believing, ah, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. That's the him. In other words, if death can't defeat you, nothing can defeat you. Addiction can't defeat you. Abuse, it cannot defeat you. Divorce, it can't defeat you. A divisive nation, it cannot defeat you. Hatred, wickedness, evil, it can't defeat you. The resurrection is the greatest boost in confidence. Your God's good, you stay faithful. Your God is good, you stay faithful. Your sin's been covered, your shame's been carried. You've been robbed in the best of ways, amen? At this time at all of our campuses, we're gonna pray. I'm gonna ask that you just bow your heads and close your eyes. And at all of our services, individuals have given their life to Christ and it's been outstanding. And if you're here and you wanna place your faith in Jesus Christ, you wanna have peace within your heart, you wanna have purpose for living and you wanna have a home in heaven and all the other things, that's you, would you just slip your hand up with no one looking around? We would just love to pray together at all of our campuses. Campus pastors are leading in the rooms that they're in. If that's you, in the balcony, anyone else, just slip your hand up. I wanna give my life to Christ today. Church, all together, pray this with me. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for my sins. Today, I repent of my sins. I ask for your forgiveness and I receive you as the Lord of my life. And today I am choosing to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.